Representative Kerr. Thank you. Lindsay, is it okay to call you Lindsay? And thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I do have a, uh, Lindsay brought with her a copy of her presentation, and so that will be passed out to all of the committee members. So, uh, no one here questions the fact that education in Oklahoma, as well as in America, is having some real problems. We want our children to be educated. As I said earlier, in starting this presentation, that our founding fathers were very committed to education because it was their belief that uh, in order to pass along the principles to preserve our republic, we needed to have an educated populace. We need to have citizens who not only understand the principles upon which our nation was founded, but who are able to produce a quality workforce so that we can continue to maintain the lifestyle that we have. America has, in the past, always been the leader in across the world. And as you've heard today, we have fallen behind in the area of education. We're no longer number one. We're a long way from that. Uh, so the question is, our Common Core standards what is really needed to improve education. I personally think that the Common Core state standards are federalization of education, and this violates local control, which if we each had a dollar for every time we hear the word local control while we're in session, uh, each one of us as legislators would be uh, much better off than we are today, I think, because we use that word a lot. We also believe, uh, many of us do, in limited <coughs> government. Uh, we do know that one size does not necessarily fit all. I had both of my grandsons yesterday, a 16-month-old and a four-year-old, and they are as different as, oh, it's just unbelievable. Both wonderful little boys, but they're very different. And to try to teach them the same way would not work, and has not worked. But anyway, this is our the presentation, and we'd be happy to take questions now. So, members, uh, do you have, has the, uh, has uh, Lindsay's presentation been passed it out to you? Okay. So, why don't we have both of you ladies please stand, yes. And members, if you have any questions directed toward them, feel free to ask. All right, thank you very much. We will have questions in this segment for 20 minutes from now until 10.30. And we have one in queue so far. If there are others, please raise your hand and we'll get you in the queue. Representative Canada, you are recognized for a question. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, first, I guess the question I have written down here is uh, in your reference that national standardization tends to be counterproductive. I would ask you to put the College Board's advanced placement curriculum and testing, would that fit in that context of being counterproductive in terms of advancement of rigor? So what's unique about things like the, like the College Board me, is that there has been competition among different uh, testing companies at the collegiate level. What we're seeing now truly is standardization in the sense that there is one common set of assessments and tests that's being pushed on states. It's being required of states by the federal government. And this is the distinction that I really want to make is that, you know, we have a national assessment that's a norm, or that's a representative sampling of students, it's the name. But that is a national, not a federal test. And right now, uh, what the administration is doing by providing incentives from the federal government uh, is making, is taking this from a, a national common push to a federal push. And they're getting really close to crossing some statutory prohibitions in federal law that prevent the federal government from getting involved in curriculum. Yes, Paul. Yes, if I could follow up, I appreciate that uh, perspective. Uh, but I think I heard you say that the national board, the college board is, is doing a, a good job in terms of uh, reflecting rigor. A little problem there in terms of testing selection. 
but uh, you mentioned Nate. Um, two questions within that. As Nate, are you seeing Nate as a norm reference or a criterion criterion reference test? And is that an example of the standardization? And is it effective standardization? Sure. So on, on your first point. Um, I think there are real holes in the content of the Common Core push. Uh, as I think Jenny and I both pointed out, uh, the math experts and reading experts that are on part of the validation committees have pointed out these holes. Um, the NAEP is a random sampling of students across the country. So students from states participate in the NAEP, and it gives us a good cross-section, uh, norm reference cross-section of what's happening at the state level, right? When we say criterion reference, criterion reference, for example, would be Oklahoma testing its students on Oklahoma content standards norm reference being comparing that uh, to other states across the country. All right, thank you. Representative Nelson for a question. I guess you don't have to stand ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like some clarification on the difference between standards and curriculum and how they're different and how they may drive each other uh, as well. I think that's point of persistent confusion on my part, I'm sure on other people's parts. Um, do, does everybody have that the paper that's actually produced? Do you have the paper with you? Yeah, thank <laughs> If you'll notice, um, I actually addressed that particular issue in the paper. It wasn't something I had time to do uh, on the presentation, but I make the point um, that for standards, for example, um, you can say you need to know how the number of um, atoms relate to Avogadro's number, for example, which I'm using. I don't know why I didn't do great in chemistry, but I remember that. Um, you can say that, but then and that's a standard, basically, that that's something that you want at, at overall for students to know, but then the curriculum part has to be much more has to be much deeper because you, as a teacher, have to teach to the point that's going to make them understand that standard. So I would have to go into as a teacher, I would have to teach them what Avogadro's number is, what moles are, what atoms are, in order to get them to reach that standard. So standards are very broad uh, kind of a framework, whereas curriculum has to be the part of the piece where you're actually teaching them to understand what it is in the umbrella of that standard. Does that make more sense? Sure. And just to follow up as to why this is problematic, we often see curricula following the standards that are set. So states will have textbooks aligned to their curricula, professional development aligned to the curricula. And so I'm afraid that as we go down this rabbit hole of national standards that the federal government is financing and supporting, that we will see federal support for curricula uh, professional development. We've already seen uh, some of this starting to, to happen. So uh, federal support for curriculum, professional development, uh, textbooks adoption, uh, you name it. We think that that's follow the curriculum. Yes, for follow-up. I mean, one of my frustrations is that that happens historically. I mean, with the recent changes in standards in California, I mean, I was talking to somebody with a textbook company that did, that's going to start driving that. I mean, that's happening now. What do states do? What can we do now to stop that kind of creep so that we can adopt our own set of standards voluntarily? Because my impression is that this, these are a set of voluntary standards. We can do what we're doing now. We can do this. We can choose to do it. But my question is, how do we basically protect against you know, a few big states. It kind of reminds me of the, the electoral college situation where you've got a few big states that can drive everything. I mean, is this not a way where maybe smaller states can get together and, and push back against some of that or more conservative states, whatever you want to call it, I, to, to get together and come together and develop a set of standards that more reflect the values that we have here? I mean, what, is there not some merit in, in that? Um, so. I think that at the heart of the question, that's certainly a problem, right? We know Texas and California and the Northeast sort of drive textbook adoption. Um, but is nationalizing standards the way to fix that problem? And as I mentioned before, I think decentralizing it, if anything, is a far better option. We know that this is going to cost Oklahoma a significant amount of money to adopt, billions of dollars likely over the long haul. Um, 
So I, I really think to, we need to think through, you know, is nationalizing it uh, the way to get out from under this, this problem uh, that we're seeing with California and Texas drive textbooks adoption, textbook adoption. And I think too that, you know, as we move toward um, an area of education that is, is an uncharted and exciting and uh, really uh, beginning to open up a whole new uh, school choice array of options for students, uh, online learning, I'd like to think that uh, the online learning push would ultimately circumvent a lot of these problems, particularly the large textbook issue uh, coming from, from larger states. So I think there are good ways to do that, um, decentralizing further, moving toward more online learning options. But you know, kind of selling your state educational autonomy to Washington, to distant bureaucrats sitting in Washington, I don't think it's the way to, to fix that problem. And if I could follow up on that briefly, because I think your concern is, you know, how do, how do we get out of it once we've already gone? Is that what you're saying? Or how do we find textbooks that are aligned to our, more like our standards? Is that what you're trying to get at as well? Well, my starting point is just Oklahoma kids. I mean, if we can help Oklahoma kids by joining with other states, I want to do it. If we can help Oklahoma kids by not joining with other states, I want to do that. I, but I want whatever we have to reflect Oklahoma values. And I think there are a lot of other states that would think that way too. Exactly. And I do want to point out that there are more textbooks on the market than we actually see. We tend to see textbooks from the large textbook companies because schools and districts can buy them at a cheaper rate than sometimes other textbooks. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other textbooks out there. And in fact, when we were researching uh, a bill that we brought to the attention of the committee several years ago on history standards, we found out that there's actually a company that produces history textbooks that are far and away better than any textbook that any of the big companies produce. So I think the, the options are out there. We're just not thinking out of the box, I think, well enough to, to figure out what they are because some of these textbook companies would like to sell their textbooks and they're just as willing to you know, provide ancillary materials and that kind of things as some of the big companies are. So I think we're not as bound into that box with textbook suppliers as I think we sometimes might think. All right, thank you very much. Representative Holland for a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank uh, Ms. White and uh, Ms. Burke uh, for your presentations. I think it's very informed. As a history teacher, I always, I don't like to just look at the moment that we're in. I think we did a lot. I think we've taken it in the full context. Uh, I think both of your presentations uh, gave a lot of good information. And if you have that on PowerPoint, or uh, I think some of my superintendents might be interested in as opposed to me trying to post copy of this. Uh, now my question. Um, I would say, uh, first of all, I think the reason that federal government uses money uh, to get things done, to, to encourage states to do things, is because it works. And we do the same thing here at the state level. You know, if we're going to get agency to do something, we bank money out there, that's how we get to do it. Uh, but with that being more common than a question, uh, either one of you, as, as this has been formulated and, and being put together, are you aware of any Oklahoma education leader the education system, uh, teacher group, uh, principal group, whatever, that was allowed to be a part uh, and contribute to the standards that are being developed. Is anyone in Oklahoma at the table during that conversation formulating all of that that you're aware of? I'm in a um, No, but we can we can pull through the, the uh, list of people that we're on just to double check to make sure that that's not the case and supply you with that information. I don't know any off the the top of my head, but happy to look through the list. And, and I think you're right about the federal money, just to, to touch on that briefly. I mean, it, you know, the federal government is has been handing out um, not only these stock grants now, but waivers, dangling this in front of states at a time when many states face fiscal crises. Would Oklahoma have adopted these national standards if it weren't for federal incentives? You know, I, I think it's something that um, would not be happening in Oklahoma if it weren't for the federal dollars that are being um, withheld from you and then offered back to you if you agree to the administration's chosen ed reforms. Is that a question someone in the audience would like to answer at this time? Or, okay, yes. Superintendent Barisi, our superintendent of public instruction for Oklahoma. Yes. We did have 
have representation on the writing of those standards, uh, particularly in the area of science standards. Um, a former member of the State Department of Education, Tanner Rollins, was very involved at, at the table in the writing of the science standards, and I'm going to be addressing that in my presentation as well. And uh, Kelly Kirkbride is, who is our current director of um, social studies, is also deeply involved in that efforts. And again, I will address those issues in my presentation as well. Thank you very much. Another question, Representative. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I think uh, one of the things that was brought up in the presentation and kind of got to uh, one of the questions that I had yesterday or Tuesday and another thing about you know, Lynn Johnson's war on poverty is really what pulled schools into some of these social things. We're seeing schools, uh, you know, as one representative states do the impossible, trying to meet social needs as opposed to educating children. That's a, that's a real concern of mine. Uh, second question I have, uh, in trying, you know, once I got here, I'm trying to look at the data that you have for Oklahoma and see how our kids are performing. One of the things that I find very frustrating in, in trying to do that in some context is we're constantly changing our system. And so I guess the question is, um, isn't the reliability of the data not there because we're always changing our system? Always. I mean, that seems to be the common thing in education. Is, well, it's been six years. Let's try something new. And we're always changing so we can't <coughs> look back historically and have accurate data. And I want this to be data-driven as much as anything. Well, I just wanted to address that as a former teacher as well, because I, I remember being in that situation where you have one thing that you had to do and then you had to turn and do something else. And I wanted to point out that Finland, I think everybody has heard about Finland and how well that they've done on their PISA scores and how they've turned around their educational program. And it's interesting to me, uh, the Smithsonian had a very large article on Finland. And in reading that particular article, it struck me that that's exactly what they don't do in Finland. They don't change, they have a very broad kind of framework of standards that they use in Finland. And what they do is, and this was very interesting, frankly, not only does the curriculum stay the same for each grade, but now this is interesting, every teacher moves with the student. So the student is hired, like in elementary school, for example, the student, the teacher is hired and actually goes through that they have a class and their class stays together and they go second grade and then they move on to the third grade it's all because it's all about continuity you can't and I, I think about my own son who is six and he is in first grade and they did um, addition I think for the first three or four weeks of the school and now on subtraction he doesn't know his addition facts he didn't even have them long enough to be able to learn the addition facts it's up to me on my time to teach him his addition facts. So I think continuity, you make an excellent point, and continuity is very important uh, for children and for programming. All right, thank you very much. Our, um, would you like to answer that very briefly? Sure. We just have four minutes left, okay. so. Just on the, you bring up the historical point, you know, No Child Left Behind was an overreach in that it set a ticking clock on states, as I mentioned. You know, 2014, all states have to be proficient. But you do not correct one federal overreach with another federal overreach, which is what's happening right now. Washington stepping in and trying to do what it's been unable to do for nearly half a century now and kind of improve educational outcomes from Washington. It just, it won't work. Thank you very much. Representative McDaniel for a question. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And Ms. Burke, I, this might be for you or for Ms. White. The reference to Finland, and we all aspire to be like Finland, but for those of us that have looked at Finland and in the studies, we keep going back to the test scores, but are there studies that look at the culture, the per capita income spend in that country? Is the education system open to all? What is the culture on education there? Is there a study that looks at that as well? The studies I always hear are simply the test scores. Do you agree? Uh, well, I'm not an expert on Finland. I, I don't have, I, she might know a little bit more than I do on it, but I will say that the United States spends more money than any other country in the world for people on education. Uh, and we have uh, not seen any increases as a result of that. So I don't think it's a spending problem per se. Uh, it's a problem of not empowering parents with control over those dollars. So if we really wanted to improve education outcomes in Oklahoma, I think kind of moving on the reforms that have taken place this past year are really beginning to empower parents more with school choice options to do more than any centralized standard setting could ever do. Follow up? Yes. Does it disturb you 
that as we look at medical school, law school, and we do go to national standards on those. Most of us know when we go to a doctor that across the country we have standards for what we want those doctors to have trained for, to, to practice on up. Does it not worry you that we want to give each state the right to change those standards? I, I certainly would want to do it for medical schools. Well, it doesn't worry me at all. We're a country built on federalism. That's how we're supposed to work. And the standards that are set, professional standards, are just those professional standards that are set independently of the federal government. There's no federal involvement with how those standards are set. And I think beyond that, the reason that our higher ed system is the envy of the world, unlike our K-12 system, is because we have competition and choice. That's the reason we're seeing such great outcomes. So I think, if, again, if we start decentralizing our standards and empowering parents for school choice, we'll see far more uh, improvements than we would otherwise. Right. Thank you. Representative Kennedy, for a question. Thank you very briefly, Ms. White. I uh, appreciate the uh, Carl Springer statement in, in your presentation here. My question deals with specific correlations, either high negative, high positive. What is the correlation between the common core standards that we have now that's been, has been developed and the ACT scores? Well, I don't think that they, there's been a correlation made between the Common Core State Standards and the ACT scores. I think what I was specifically discussing is the separate issue of if we already have, some, have something that the state is already paying for and that solves the same problem that we have said is initially our concern is that we want to make sure that our kids are getting an education that's you know, on par with the rest of the nation, then we already have a system that's available to do that in the state of Oklahoma. So why are we going to something else that might cost us more money when we already have something? One follow up. I, I, I probably agree with that statement, but is no correlations have been run? Honestly, that's not something that I particularly looked at. I don't know if Lindsay has. I mean, with the Common Core, it's been so rushed. There have been no studies conducted so far. Thank you. Thank you very much. Representative Nelson for a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. One question I have here is, my understanding is this is a voluntary thing that the state led, but then it's, the, is this, are you saying that it's basically been hijacked by the education department nationally? Uh, what, I mean, as long as you're sending money to Washington, what, what can we do? Um, and how do we stop it? I mean, what's the plan? Because the problem is more and more money goes there. And if we adopt it, we're tied. If we don't adopt it, we're tied. I mean, it's, that's the situation that we're in the states. So what do we do? You're, you're right. And essentially, uh, you're uh, really beholden to Washington with your own money. Uh, you know, we've seen this, this crazy kind of scheme over the years where state taxpayers, over and over, local and state taxpayers, send dollars to Washington. They get filtered through the Federal Department of Education. The Department of Ed sends that money back to Oklahoma. And for what? And somehow they're surprised that that doesn't increase academic achievement. Um, so I think if, if we uh, expect to see improvements, it's going to be by one, Washington allowing states to get out from a lot of this bureaucratic red tape. And that's something we've been working very hard on doing. So the best thing state leaders can do is say, we want genuine flexibility. We want to be able to completely opt out of No Child Left Behind. We want less federal involvement, not more of it. And I think that's the, the best thing. If you don't remember, Washington is only a 10% stakeholder. Uh, today, it's gone up a little since the 7% figure in 1994, but Washington covers about 10% of all the money that's spent on education. States and localities pay 90% of that money. Washington has far exceeded its 10% share. Thank you so much. This concludes the time for questions. Representative Kern, you won't say just another word. I want to thank you again for allowing uh, me to have this uh, study. Uh, two things that were mentioned in questions that I would like to briefly touch on, parents and Oklahoma values. Uh, I think we need to keep in mind that who has the primary responsibility for educating students? I believe it's the parents for educating their students. They ought to have a primary fundamental uh, say in education. I believe the development of Common Core standards, giving the federal government this overreach into education will harm parents' uh, involvement. And then Oklahoma values, that's a real issue that I think we need to think about. Uh, Oklahoma values and American values. 
I want our citizens, whether they're in Oklahoma, our students, whether they're in Oklahoma or whether they're in any other state in the nation, to be the best educated students they can be in the world. I want them to be profoundly American citizens who are proud to be Americans. I think something we need to keep in mind as we look at Common Core standards is whose values are going to be implemented and forced down the American public through Common Core standards. So thank you very much. Thank you very much and thank all of you who have presented and uh, taken an interest in this. We are going to take a 10 minute break, so I'd like to ask you to be back in here promptly at 10.42. Uh,